Welcome back, everyone, to our journey through Colossians. My name is Sam Bodner, and I'm joined here by my buddy Radon Haskins. Radon, how you doing today? I'm alive, man. We are in the summertime with COVID-19, baby. It's a good life. Heck yeah, definitely a bit muggy outside here in Bloomington, needless to say. You're the one outdoors right now, though. It's the only way to live, baby. <laughs> All right, so on our last episode, right on, um, we started Colossians chapter 3. We went through verses 1 through 11, talking about what it means to be the new man in Christ. And now today, we're going to be going through verses 12 through 17. And what's kind of going to be like our focus here for today? Um, our focus here with 12 through 17 will be the body life. And what, I, what do I mean? I mean, what does it mean to be strategically placed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? And what does that mean to live with other people who are of the light, who are of of, of Christ? And another thing we call it is, what does it mean to be brothers and sisters in Christ? What does it mean to be in the body of Christ? How does that look? Um, how do we deal with one another? And how do we grow together as one unit? And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So. All right, sounds good. Now, before we dive into that, uh, we're just going to introduce a new segment to everyone. Um, we're just going to be talking about like our favorite worship song, what we've been kind of jamming out to and praising God with this week. So, right on. What's uh, what's maybe a song or two that uh, has been really ministering to you? Um, I haven't had a song that's been ministering to me. I'm actually not a, I'm not a worship song kind of guy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. I'm a horrible person. But I'm more, um, I'm more of like, I'm gonna read a good book. <laughs> that hence my mind thinks about the, the, the glories and magnis, magnificence of the Lord. And a book that I've been reading has been, I've been working through these days. It's called The Story of Christianity, Volume One and Two. Um, I think it's by Justo Gonzalez. Um, he's a Latino man who. Who, who's, who's given is a narrative of Christianity from the he, his Hebraic days all the way up until to about 2000. And so it's a really good read, really easy. Most history is born and sucks because it gives dates and says this is what happened. But it's, I feel like he writes more of like a narrative genre like in the Bible to okay. get his points across. And it's really good. It's a really good thing. So that's what I've been doing. Sounds good. So there was my failed attempt at talking about a worship song segment, but I'll just plug in. Um, I've been listening to Waste It All by United Pursuit. It's just been, that's been a great one. Just realizing like the extravagant glory of God. That's definitely brought me to tears a couple of times this week, but I guess it's not the hardest thing to do. And then uh <laughs> started reading uh, 10 Dumb Things That Smart Christians Believe by Larry Osborne. And that's been uh you know, pretty interesting and also kind of revealing and just some old childhood things that I remember hearing in church that Larry is just kind of going to town on. So I definitely appreciate it. Okay. Well, one of the things that I've, I've noticed was um, a song called Waymaker. And um, there was a meme out there that said, Waymaker is like the old, old song and the new song is The Blessing by Carrie Joe. And <laughs> And for me, I was just like, the reason why is because we've been listening to the K-Love version of those songs instead of like, listening to the original content. I'm, I'm not against K-Love, but sometimes K-Love is corny. And we started listening to um, the original version, which is by Sinatch. And that's the version people should listen to. And we would have not left Waymaker for the blessing. So there we go. Okay. So You're putting your foot the down there. Okay listening to all right well transitioning now right on do you want to start off in verse 12 and get us going in our scripture today okay that'll be great and uh, uh are you csb again yes it's the only version <laughs> actually actually i take that back now because i looked up what kind of um translation it is and it's not word for word Ooh. Ooh. still going with it then oh yeah huh. oh yeah from what I looked up, I might, I need to probably go back and, you know, look at what it was saying by that. But, yeah, so ESV is still king. That's right. Like standard version, baby. Right now, at least. 
So, yeah, let's jump into it. <laughs> um, and it says um, um, in verse 12, therefore, if you have a highlighter, you should highlight or underline that with your pen in your Bible. As God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved. We're not going to jump into what chosen ones mean. Um, <laughs> Unconditional election, what? Uh, <laughs> or... <laughs> Those who believe are the chosen ones. That's that's neither here nor there. Let's keep on going. (laughs) Put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Interesting. Above all, Put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Amen. That's all. Actually, we could just finish the podcast there, but it would not do us justice of all the studying that we've done prior to, to not looking deeper into this. That's fair. One of the things that I noticed in verse 12, he says, therefore... And so he's 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 alluding, he's giving another thought based upon the previous things before. And we can look at that last section when it says in verse 11, in Christ, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. And one of the things that I've, like we've talked about, is that we don't stop being those things that's in that list. We don't stop being, you know, a Jew if we were born a Jew. We don't stop being Greek if we don't if we were born a Greek. I don't stop being African American. You don't stop being American, right? But he's saying because we are in Christ, then we treat each other as though we are in Christ. That is the therefore. Right. And now he unfolds what does it mean to treat other people who are in christ and if christ is all in all in that person how should we treat them then and i really just enjoy what he says he says holy and and dearly loved like holy is a word that like we always looked at as like perfection but it's more than that it means to be whole like to be perfect without blemish is one thing, but to be whole and not have any cracks in yourself is another thing. Mm. So there is no deficiency in anything that you are now when you're in Christ. Now, work, walking that out is different. That's sanctification. But once you come to Christ, he says, holy, you're whole now. And I believe as believers sanctification is us working walking that out and us coming to the realization that we are whole um and he says dearly loved i love that because the things that he talks about afterward the things that we have that we are to do as believers is birthed out of god loving us that same way right so we don't have to think that we're not accepted by christ that we are um that we have to walk on eggshells around god no he just dearly loves you because he's he's that's that's what he's extravagantly giving you through christ and and what he says is that he puts on the new man again he says put on compassion kindness humility gentleness and patience so what do you think I'm going to ask you, man, what do you think those things look like? What do those words mean? What does that list of words mean to you? I think for one, the list just proves that I'm none of those things all the time, right? Like that's, you had 
many Pharisees and many people just challenged Jesus throughout his lifetime, and he responded with tact and with humility, with grace. That's not always me. And that's that's not always all of us. Like these are this list here and by the way, this list is by no means exhaustive either, but this is a perfect we talked about the fruit of the spirit last week in Galatians five. You have a perfect contrast of what it means to uh, have your motives unchecked at the door and be, you know, of the flesh per se. Um, and then actually to be listening to what the Holy Spirit is speaking into you. And, you know, you continue a little bit with this idea of forgiveness. And, you know, sometimes we gloss over that, but forgiveness isn't always for us as humans, like the easiest thing to do for God. Um for God, even, I mean, he, he doesn't, there's no strings attached. There's no like, ah, I will only forgive you if you do this or donate this or say this a million times, but there's still, you know, for God, there's still a little bit of, I guess, pain per se. And knowing that whenever we sin, we're sinning against God. So while he is just and faithful to forgive us, as, uh, John says in, uh, first John one, there's still this this hurt that God feels in knowing that we as his kids are sinning against him. And I think we have to look like for us, you know, when we, when we get to this list, you know, these are ways we respond, obviously not just um, in forgiveness, but also a- as we carry out our lives with people. And I think we really have to ask this question, like when we, when we take the this list together, when we take the idea of forgiveness, I think we have to ask ourselves, what does forgiveness look like within us? and in our relationships with others. So do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, sure. Um, we have to understand what forgiveness is. Um, the word forgiveness is literally meaning to give up a debt. Mm. That's old. Like, and and you, if you notice, he says in the forgiveness, he says, just as the Lord has forgiven you. Right. right. Wow. Wow. So he's saying the debt of sin that you had against God, God wiped it out and then started over with you in a relationship. That's tough. Absolutely. That's tough. Um, and in the same way, we, we can understand that forgiveness is a relational aspect. It's a relational. It's a relational word. It always has to have have a, a, at least two parties involved. And Jesus being the the prototype, if you will, um, we have to be able to do the same thing. And and forgiveness, number one, does not mean does not mean trust. Right. Right. And so, if somebody hurts you physically or or like really bad. Or someone stole money from you and that person comes to you and asks for forgiveness or doesn't you still are supposed to forgive and release the debt mm-hmm. and the, the point of forgiveness is hopefully one day there will be reconciliation right now if reconciliation doesn't happen that does not mean you're in sin but I do believe that forgiveness is given so that reconciliation can happen. Now, what does that look like? I don't know. That mean does that mean you have to put boundaries in between you and a person? Maybe. Yes. It's, yes. Yeah. Does that mean you don't put yourself back in a close relationship in that way so that um, you continuously get yourself hurt? You don't have to. You're free from that. Absolutely. Um, until trust is regained. And I believe that the father does that with us too. Like he doesn't hold our sin against us and he removes it like it was never there. But at the same time, he does come back around and trains us in living right. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that revolves in, or not revolves, results in consequences too. I mean, you look at David with the uh, adultery with Bathsheba, like, his kid was taken from him and his house from that point on was continuously was constantly under 
turmoil and attack. So sometimes yeah. we'll, you know, I think there's like that myth that like forgive means forget. And it's not necessarily the case. Like obviously like, you know, we it's not like we sin and say, God, I messed up and God goes, okay, boom, uh, like that sin never happened. Like, oh, the almighty God forgot. But it's not like you said, it's not a debt being held against us. It's not something that we're, you know, we, we have to pay back because we can't pay it back. And that's what I love when the writer of Hebrews also says, like, don't have that root of bitterness in you. So while, like you said, there's not going to be an immediate, oh, man, I completely, you you stole my car. You, you talked behind my back. You shared something that I said to you in confidence. That doesn't mean I'm going to trust you with important information right off the bat again. But it does mean that I'm no longer, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to look at you as someone that owes me anything or someone that I'm going to spend my time and attention like holding anger at you toward yeah that's right and for the sake of relationship moving forward and so when you remove the debt you're saying my trust can be earned back Mm -hmm. but it will take time and it will happen when I put up guide posts for myself so that I can love you the best way Mm-hmm. Right, and that's that's that is forgiveness, and and we got to ask ourselves when we've forgiven someone, have we released the debt? Do we still feel like that person owes us when we talk to them, right? Or when we meet with them, mm-hmm. and and that's that's a hard one, and we can sometimes we have to continuously forgive so that we don't let the bitterness grow. So that's a really heavy part, but I think it was something that we need to needed to deal with, especially when we're with each other as family. We will hurt each other. Right. <laughs> I mean, healing hurts too, but that's why, again, like we're told, we're, we're holy, we're set apart, we're called to respond in kindness. Um, you know, be humble with, and, and be patient with people too like sometimes someone's going to keep messing up over and over and over again and you're going to keep forgiving them but that doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt you and it doesn't cost you you know a little bit of something inwardly to forgive as well right but we when we do it god's way in that we share in god's wholeness and who god is we share in his character Mm -hmm. Um, and the truth is, is that if we're not careful, if we don't walk in this stuff with each other, we will become the thing that offended us. Mm. It just turns into a mirror. That's how revenge starts. Because when we choose not to walk in that forgiveness, the same way God forgave us, when we choose not to walk in compassion and humility and kindness, we can become the thing that we say hurt us right. and in the same way God will still hold us responsible it's yeah. tough but it's truth and in verse 14 he says this he says above all so all this stuff is, is great he's saying all that's great but above all put on love which is the perfect bond of unity and this is a question I was always thinking about and always wondering. Can you have complete unity without love? Is unity a fruit of love when you're walking in love with somebody? Look, I mean, you can have relationships with people where you're united. It's, a, you know, we benefit the other uh, in, a, in a work scenario, um, sometimes for relationships that are, you know, people kind of using each other for sex to get gratification to get and to feel something i mean those are cases where there's unity sure but it's it's not it's not rooted in love it's not geared for the purposes of as we read at the end of the section it's not glorifying god it's in everything we do right in word or in deed glorify god through what you're doing and i think relationships or relationships that lack biblical unity are also the ones that are going to be lacking love. I don't know. Yes. Is there, is there a place where you can think of where you could see a biblical, a true, what you want to call a biblical friendship or relationship working out without love? 
No. Because I don't either. I just don't think it makes sense at all. <laughs> no. It's, it's, and, and, and when we say love, we're talking about us, your, your greatest good at my highest expense. Right. That type of love. Now, when you have unity, according to the world, is always what can I get out of it? But biblical love that leads to unity is what, how can I serve you? And I think that's the way we have to be in as the body of Christ is when is the last time I said, Hey, how can I help you with dot, dot, dot. And I want anything out of when was the last time I said an encouraging word, right? An encouraging statement about someone without trying to get something out of them. When was the last time I, helped a friend out, helped a brother and sister in Christ out on a really heavy or hard project without looking for help. Um, I mean, without looking for something in the future where I say, hey, I did this for you. Now and it's time to pay your dues back, yeah. Yeah, we can't do that as, as followers of Christ. That's not biblical love, nor does that lead to, to biblical unity. And we have to have Jesus at the center to be able to do that. We need his help. We can't do that on our own. He needs to be ruling can, in our hearts, yeah. Yeah, because it'll be defaulting. We will default to our normal mode without the help of the Holy Spirit bringing us together as one body. Mm. And so I think outside of human relationships, another thing, um, I know we were talking about this earlier, but like asking ourselves, when's the last time we went to the Word um, or just in prayer, not to seek knowledge, not to seek something for ourselves to build our kingdom, but to build God's, to praise Jesus for who he is. I think it's so easy to think of all these needs for uh, for us, uh, needs we want to take God to other people, which are great. Like he, he, he wants that. He wants to be in relationship with us. But when it just becomes like me or you or whoever preaching a monologue to God, are we actually seeking a relationship with him? Yeah, that's right. It's tough, man. It's tough stuff to think about, but it's good stuff to, to process through. And then he says, and let the peace of Christ to which you are also called, it's an interesting statement, in one body rule your hearts. Man. So he's talking to him collectively. He says in one body, let this peace rule. And in another place, I think he says, as long as it depends on you, live at peace with one another, right? I think it's Romans, Romans 12, I think. And I see that like, and this peace that he's talking about isn't like, oh, there's no war going on. He says the same, the same wrath that was coming to us and Jesus removed from us, and brought peace there and satisfied God's wrath, had that same thing going on amongst each other as believers in Christ. Mm. Our, that troubles, troublesome that we get from the conviction of the Holy Spirit when we first heard the gospel, that yo, you are standing before a righteous holy God who loves you, but you're guilty before. And what are you gonna do when, when you have to stand before him, how are you going to say you're good enough? And he's saying, no, you sinned against the holy, righteous God. And that friction, that eternal friction, that eternal war in your soul is going on. And Jesus removed it. And that peace that you now have, have it amongst each other. So that same, the same peace from salvation he said that same salvational peace, let it be in your relationships. So there don't have to be no war between each other. Mm. And if the whole old adage, right? What he's done in you, he wants to do through you. And that is good. And <laughs> yeah. That is good news. Just, yeah, that's good news. And he says, let it rule your hearts. Don't be an argumentative person. <laughs> oh man easier said than done sometimes <laughs> you, you don't you don't have to be right in every situation that's what peace does <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And I think, you, you know, there's a lot of topics that we're all passionate about too. And I think it was Derek, our, our campus pastor um, through Chi Alpha that posted this, but what he was saying was, you know, there's all these arguments and conversations over, over like how to handle COVID-19. How's, what's the government doing right? What's the government doing wrong or other political discussions? And the question he asked was like, you know, something along the lines of is the way you're handling um, th- like the way you the way you express your view right now, um, are you doing it with the same humility and the same grace and the same openness to having a conversation with someone that when they may disagree with like if that person disagrees with you on your political views, are they still going to be recognizing you as a humble and open person when you're trying to share the gospel with them? Like, are you yeah. being are you being peaceful in the way you express what you're passionate about, your politics, your philosophy, your books, your the way you think your craft or whatever your job should be? Are you expressing that in a peaceful, kind and compassionate way to the point where even though they may disagree with you, they may still be open to having a gospel centered conversation with you? Mm. Yes, I thought that was really powerful, especially in an area where, you know, it's about to get very heated between Biden and Trump here coming up. So, yes, I was um, sitting up talking with one of my friends and I love her to death. She's a sister in Christ. She's totally smarter than me. And she's been teaching me a lot of stuff about the Bible in Colorado. She is a little, little liberal leaning and I'm a little bit more conservative leaning. And you know what? I still didn't, what we talked about, we did it in a way because we loved each other more than we loved our um, our thoughts on politics. Mm. And so we were able to share with each other what we agreed and disagree with, but in a way that kept peace between us. Because I know, and she knows, that we are part of the body of Christ. And going forward, I want to be able to call her and be like, hey, come out with me here to go preach the gospel if if that ever if the lord allows that to happen but in order for that to happen we have to have that kind of peace that's from christ that says the war between us is over and and we should be able to do that out there in the world and that question you asked is very convicting the way we act with towards the world towards each other is indicative of whether or not they're going to receive any other truths from us. Well, I mean, that's the thing, too, because there's so many divisions in politics just all over the place. It's a media firestorm. You know, people are going to Twitter. They're going to Facebook, Instagram, whatever they're doing to call, you know, you stupid conservatives, you snowflakes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And if people see division and fighting in the church, they're going to be like, there's enough conflict in my life. I don't need one more thing. I really don't. And I, I don't blame them when they look at a local church or, you know, Christian figures that are fighting over things on social media or in the public eye. And it's like, man, I don't, I don't blame non-believers for not wanting to come in. Yeah. Cause it's not a house united on love. It's yeah. a house divided over politics or over theology or whatever it is. Right, right. But Jesus is still working on us. And because he's still working on us, the way we deal with the world who don't know Christ is the same way we should deal with them. And they the same grace and the same mercy. That's right. And then he goes on to say, let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Interesting. Everything you do, do it in the name of Jesus. So, as the believer, we have to remember that because we bear the name of Christ, we are Jesus to people around us. 
And when they see us, what do they say? That Jesus is awesome. Or is that Jesus horrible? Right. And that's the place where we would like to end this week is that remember that because we have Jesus in our hearts and in our lives, let us live like that with each other and with those around us. We love you all. Hope you have a blessed week and a blessed holiday. Have a good day and a good week. Remember, Jesus loves you. All right, bye.